DM Geezer Jim here for another, uh, uh, excuse me, another episode of our classic product and module reviews. I had started a series on Mistara recently. We had looked at GAZ1, Gazetteer 1, the Grand Duchy of Carmakos previously. I wanted to continue along in that series, uh, but in doing so, I kind of realized that not everyone knows what Mistara is or the references to it, so I might be discussing something with very little uh, context. So I wanted to go ahead and step out a wee bit here and um, go with this one. Show everyone a good map of Mistara. Now this is a, a high quality reproduction of the actual map. This is probably, as it says in the bottom corner here, it says the known world 1000 AC after crowning. Uh, this is in relation to the Temple Empire of Thyatis over here on the right side. So I just so you have context in in to to keep the various nations that we're going through in the Gazetteer. I wanted to take a few minutes at the start of it and take a look at Mistara. Now, if you Google up D and D Mistara M Y S T A R A, you're going to get some maps that are about ten times this big. They're, that's accurate. This is a very small map, even though it looks pretty big. Uh, the first thing I love. I want to point out about it, it's done in the traditional hex crawl style that was prevalent for Expert, Companion, Master, and, and Immortal part of the Beckme series. So it, the art styling is, I like it, it's unique, it's very utilitarian, it's nowhere near as attractive as the Anna B. Meyer map of Greyhawk. Uh, it's nowhere near as, as artistic looking as your classic Forgotten Realms or even your modern Mike Schley uh, Forgotten Realms Sword Coast maps. They're utilitarian, um, but they tell you exactly what's where in relation to each hex. This was designed for hex crawl, something that we can talk about differently. So just to give everyone a little bit of context, uh, oops, my apologies as I zoom around here too quickly. Yesterday we did a product called uh, the Grand Duchy of Carmakos GA1 and kind of zooming in on the map here real quick in relation to this, the, the world map we're looking at on the, other, on the other view. This is a small region of Karamakos, the duchy that we looked at in Gazetteer 1. So just so you have some reference, this is the same region in context of the rest of the world. Um, small region, small corner of the world. This is honestly one quarter of one continent out of five that are listed as... Uh, Mistara. This is the only one that was truly developed to the extent uh, that that we that we've seen in the Gazetteer. There's, I believe, fifteen gaz uh, modules, publications, source books, whatever you want to call them, in the Gazetteer series, and those are all uh, centered right around here. So, just to give you some worldwide context as we as we continue into the the GAZ series here. Uh, so yesterday we looked at oops. Yesterday we looked at GAZ one and uh, kind of went into a little, spent a little bit of time looking at the product more than anything else from a formatting standpoint. I didn't get into a ton of detail in relation to the actual Grand Duchy of Karamakos itself. Um, so let me take a couple minutes and do that. Uh, the Grand Duchy of Karamakos is a newer nation. Basically, uh, where are we looking at? I'm sorry, let me get back down to the list of NPCs. <laughs> The current ruler, for all, for, for all intent and purposes, traded his lands in the kingdom of Thyatis for lands that were unclaimed at that point. They were wild lands, as it were. The Empire of Thyatis had established some, some holds here, expanded westward from their normal border, and the, the, the duke in question, uh, I'll get to his name in just a second... I want to say it's Duke Karamakos himself, and that's why it was named after that. Let's just be accurate with our naming conventions here. Get down to our NPCs. Yes. But anyway, uh, yep, I was right. Uh, Duke Stefan Karamakos III traded a lot of his ancestral holdings in the Empire Thaetis to claim this region in the name of Thaetis. So he was given the land grant. This was then called the Grand Duchy of Karamakos. It's considered an independent nation by the rest of the world, but it's a vassal nation to Thyatis. So it's a new nation forming 
Not a whole heck of a lot going on, uh, going in its favor. The coastal areas are pretty well, um, pretty well developed. The interior region is pretty wild. There's a lot of, if you look at, look at the map, there's a lot of hinterlands. It's a gigantic forest, hilly forest, some mountains, some hill areas. Not a lot of clear farmlands, pastures, plains, and all that. So it's a rugged territory that's currently being uh, brought to brought to heal, I guess is a good way to say it. Um, so that was the first one we looked at. It, it's it's ideal for a first step for a campaign. It's still kind of a wild land, kind of the, the borderlands area as it was. Uh, a few developed cities, a few established areas, a couple of decent uh, caravan trails, some well-established supply lines, but the majority of the lands are still considered untamed. Um, so yeah. This presented, as all of your gazetteers will, they present names of NPCs, little bits of information about the geography and the locations as far as your settlements, population counts, military TOE, to, uh, order of equipment, uh, order of battle and equipment, stuff like that. <clears throat> it's a good product to have. Now, I did say yesterday that they follow a common theme. They do. Some of the gazetteers emphasize one thing a little bit more than others. There are a couple that are actually completely... We'll, we'll get through those as we go. So, GAZ-1 is Grand Duchy of Carmacos, the small region right here, a fledgling kingdom as it was. A vassal state of the Empire of Theatus being ran by Duke Carmacos as he tries to build his world up, tries to build his nation up, um, bringing in... Immigrants, colonizers, as well as working to to integrate the local population. So for the second one, we're going to go here to the north and to the east, and we're looking at the Emirates of Yalarum. Yalarum. Um, now, this is kind of a nice thing to get into in the extent that we had a little bit of a discussion in the last video, we had a little bit of a discussion in the last uh, stream chat about older content. Uh, being being deemed culturally insensitive, culturally inappropriate. This could potentially fall into that basket. I'm not here to judge good, bad, or ugly. I've acknowledged in multiple other recordings, multiple other streams, that the writing and presentation of these products is not good by modern standards. But I caution all of us from throwing away the content itself because of its presentation. So... You know, that's going to kind of shine through here. Uh, you may start looking at this going, oh, hell no, that's nothing but Arabic um, Middle Eastern cultural appropriation. And, and you're right to an extent. What we call cultural appropriation now, uh, back in the 80s, they called it historical reference and inclusion. Go figure. Um, you know, nowadays it's considered bad form for a non-Arabic person to publish a fantasy setting based on, on Arabian Middle Eastern, Egyptian uh, history, you know, Turkish history, the Ottoman Empire, all that kind of stuff. The, the Middle Eastern, the Central Asia, Middle Eastern area is represented in this module. The history of the Emirates of Yalarum, you know, United Arab Emirates is a real country right now. So there's 100% parallels drawn between these kingdoms here on the in the world of Mistara and historical kingdoms with a bunch of fantasy elements added to it, i.e. the elves, the dwarves, you have all of your bad guys up in the Broken Lands. Uh, we'll take a look at those as we get to those series. But you've got representation of your, of your North Native American, North American uh, Plains tribes and the Artrugian clans. You get up into the Enger Khanate, you're dealing with more of a, a Central American steppe culture, Mongol, um, Mongolian type of a, a thing here. And then you've got over here in the kingdom of Veslin, that's your Nordic. You see a bunch of little fjords and stuff built into that. So that's a complete uh, parallel with Denmark and honestly, I think uh, Great Britain and Scandinavia. So, you know, there's, there's parallels that are drawn. The Empire of Thaetis is very representative of... We'll get to that. Um, I think it's more of a Roman style, Roman-esque, Central Roman as, as Rome spread out from Italy through the rest of, the, uh, through the rest of Europe, um, that kind of a thing. Others could argue that it's a Germanic, a Central, uh, your, your, your Central European. We're not doing Thaetis today, but just to give everyone a little bit of, of 
context when we look at the different regions that are presented in the gazetteers. Absolutely, 100%, they were designed to mirror, to parallel, to present historical, true earth histor histories, cultural histories, and cultural mythologies in a playable format. So um, enough about that. Disclaimer out of the way. Older product printed in 1987. Uh, probably older than most of the people that play D&D these days. I, I think I was 14, maybe 15 when this popped out. So, you know, dating myself along in the process. Uh, so this is going to start out the history of the, the Emirates of Ularum. is going to start out just as Carmakos does, giving you a, a history of the, the region. Now, it gives you two different histories. The, the local version, as in the myth, the legend, the stories that are told, uh, f through through each band of nomads, through each tribe of desert wanderers, they, they hold to these stories as true. And then they have the histories the dungeon masters and the immortals know it. History is recorded by everything else. And, you know, there are, in most cases, there's parallels, and, and it even tells you right here, Yusuf al Musa's account is fairly accurate of the Alarum history as oral traditions of the Lazian people would tell it. Um, now that other cultures get left out, their portions of the history get left out because they're not the dominant cultures there, which is parallel with, with real world histories here. Um, so, you know, now, now again, a fair warning that the, the Gazetteer system, the old Mistara system, the older D&D system is going to hit home because it's based in, it's based in the world history. It's based in world mythology. Um, you know, we, we t kind of think of Forgotten Realms on its own. Uh, it was the same way, and a different series. I'm going to take that apart, bring you the expanded map, show you all of the content uh, similar to the Gazetteer system that used to be available for Forgotten Realms. So it's part and parcel for D&D &D that we incorporate history and mythology into our fantasy. And uh, this just kind of codified it into each nation representing each region representing a specific type of culture. Now there's demi-human. Uh, the, the Five Shires is all about the halflings. Very, very Tolkien-esque. Uh, you've got the, the, um, the orcs of Thar and the dwarves and the elves. Those are coming up soon. So, you know. Then you get a historical synopsis, which is actually a timeline. Every one of the gazetteers will have these. On a future project, I may go ahead and build out a timeline just for, for my Patreon uh, followers if they're interested in how each of these events line up against each other. It might be, it might be a fun project. But the timeline is accurate for each product. Um, almost all of them will tell you that 1000 AD is considered the, the modern era. BC is before crowning. AC is after crowning of Emperor Thyatis, the primary timeline. It's no different than DR. If you're looking at Forgotten Realms dates, you'll see 1594 DR, Dale Reckoning. The start of the calendar according to the Dale Lands. Yes, the guys over in Waterdeep are keeping their calendars as was set by the folks in Shadowdale 1500 years ago. CY, um, Cyrillic year um, for the Greyhawk. When the first Cyrillic Empire took his, Emperor took his throne in um, Roxas, was the first official Y. So Greyhawk is at 598 CY. So it's just the, every, sh every good world has a timeline that you can follow along and helps you flesh it out. Each of your gazetteers is going to give a specific timeline to that region. Then you get a little bit further in. Obviously, when we look at the desert, we realize the map, we realize this is a very ar arid desert uh, climate. Now, let's go over to this map. The, the, the caveat here is the, the story and the myth along, that goes along with this, there used to be a gigantic river that flowed from the mountains through the, the, uh, the Alasian Desert and led out over here in the, in the coast. Some, I don't want to get into too many details, there's a large magic, magical cataclysm that happens as part of the Mistara storyline uh, that causes fractures of the earth twisted, turned on its axis, all kinds of crazy stuff happened to the planet that Mistara sits on. Uh, a lot of that, re you know, similar to Kryn, I guess you could say, similar to the cataclysmic events that happened to the world of Kryn um, a few years before it in actual timeline-wise, but it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, the river disappears into underground. Now the entire area is this dry, arid, horrifying desert. There's still lots of wells. There's still lots of oases and stuff like that. 
but the the river that used to feed the the Nile like river that used to feed the desert has has long since disappeared below the sands. So all of the mountains they're still running off. It's just being sucked in probably up here in the Ust Urt Valley. But I digress. Getting a little bit ahead of myself there. So you have terrains and climate types. It's going to tell you about the desert wilderness, the the borderlands, central plains, what's heavily settled, what's not settled, climate. Uh, it, the the Gazetteers do a very good job of giving a dungeon master the tools to manage the ecology, to manage the weather, to understand and be able to describe that to the party. Something that it is a lot of times taken part and parcel, unless you're a dungeon master that uses the, the environment for storytelling purposes. Of native flora and fauna, this isn't the nice clean list that you had over in the GAZ-1. Uh, it's a little bit more written in, in verbose, like a, you know, as a real paragraph instead of just a block list of stuff. Same thing, though. It's going to tell you these are the kind of monsters that are prevalent here. This is the kind of wildlife. These are the herding animals. Uh, these are migratory. These are stationary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It breaks it down into mammals, birds, reptiles, marine life, and insects. So it's a pretty thorough yet brief synopsis to help you get get your get this using this area for a campaign without putting a ton of work into getting it built up. Uh, the peoples. Now, one big difference here is the fact that oh man my volume is spiking high i'm gonna turn down sorry guys uh one of the one of the things to keep in mind is in your older and i would even say in your first round of of forgotten realms the human race the human species was broken down into another half dozen two dozen races cultures species whatever you want to call them the nithians the makistanis the thaetians the elysians the alphatians all humans Different tribes, different cultures, whatever you want to call them. Differing languages. Something that to keep in mind in this world, common is a thing, but not everyone speaks common. Whereas in 5th edition, we kind of go with the idea that everything and everybody in the world learns common and only more privileged or more educated people speak one or two more languages. Typically, it's everybody knows their regional dialect and only your more educated more traveled speak common so that's that's kind of one of the older considerations from a campaign that you you may start bringing in you know um it it's it's about immersion it's about realism you know it's it's about france and germany being next door to each other for you know 1400 years of recorded history and still speaking different languages and england being across the ocean from them by a two day, you know, 80 miles across the water, and them also speaking a different language from the Irish who are across a small. You get my drift. Okay, so if you want to play with that, if you want to bring the additional, um, hey, Purple RT, thanks for joining me. Um, but yeah, if you're wanting to bring the additional aspect of having a multicultural, multicultural world into your play, then one consideration is to, to localize languages, make common not the, the word. Make it to where not every single person in Fandolin speaks common. Maybe they're speaking in local dialect. That's a bad, that's a bad example. But you have regional dialects. You have nations. If you're looking at Forgotten Realms, you have Am, Cal, and Shite. You've got Thay, uh, you've got uh, Cormier, Cormanthir, Thay. All of these guys probably have different lang different dialects of language. Um, and the 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 gazetteers lean heavily into that as far as not only languages but cultures. Not only cultures, but appearances. So you do have multicultural representation in, in your older content. Worded poorly, but it's there. there you know, it, you, you have a melting pot of several different nations, peoples that are living in this area. And even then, certain areas are, are treated as the more dominant, more, uh, you know, just like kind of like the real world, kind of like history. So anyway, we're going to get into the next section. This... Gazetteer did a better job as far as incorporating the economics in with the actual regions and the towns. Uh, this is a really, really good read when you when you get down and break it down. It's going to tell you your the rough area of a region, uh, the low list of cities, the tribal seats, overall populations. Uh, you know uh, the the emirate of Alasia. Quick over to map. Let's just so everyone sees what we're doing here. Where is the emirate of Alasia here? Is that the one in, all right, right here, right in the big 
big, big middle. The biggest one here is the first one they described. So, you know, this is describing two cities, five tribal seats, total population of 78,000 people that live here. That's a lot of people living in this desert. And, and I want to bring it into another context. This old map, this is a 24-mile hex. This isn't a huge map. If you're going from Kunzet to Yalarum, that's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 138 miles up a road. That's five days travel from one city to the next. If you know, if you're, if it's nominal, trying in fifth edition terms, that would be about a five day uh, caravan walk ride. However, you want to do it. So, you've got seventy eight thousand people living in this one very heavily arid desert region, which means your towns are very populated. There's going to be a lot of little caravan stops, oases, and all that. So, you know, just kind of leaning back into what I was talking about at the at the start of the series. Mistara is a heavily populated area. It's a it, even despite the fact that there's still a lot of new borderlands or started, there's new developing kingdoms. There's a lot of people here. Um, you know, you you probably could add up the word nice and quick and dirty math. One hundred and eight, uh, one hundred twenty six, one hundred and fifty seven, uh, hundred two hundred and sixteen, two hundred and twenty. So in this desert region. That is probably about, I mean, there's 240,000 people in the population that's listed in the Emirates of Yalarum. People, not including orcs, goblins, hobgoblins, gnolls, uh, whatever else, uh, registered citizens, as it were, of, of the, the Emirates. Heavily, heavily populated, but anyway, so you've got a lot of that, and it gets into, um, you know, What's grown here? Uh, vegetable, nuts, cucumbers, olives, olives and olive oil, peppers, apples, quinces, peaches, limes, oranges, citrons, so on and so forth. So you get into a nice good detailed breakdown of what's available in each of the regions as far as trade goods. So when you're escorting that caravan, you, the DM, has a decent idea of what's in those caravans, what's in those products. What kind of stuff is going to be cheaper in each region because it's produced there versus having to be imported across the desert from another region. These are the kind of little details that are, are that are valuable to me as a dungeon master to make a world more engaging, to make a world more believable. Um, you know, a lot of that's left to our imagination, and most of it we can take care of. But to have a, a nice uh, printed resource that really breaks it down in a consistent format is a, is a good thing. So, um, yeah, we've gotten through the economics of the Emirates, which gives you your population, all of that. You get into the society, and that gives you kind of a breakdown of your average life of, of the people in the city. This isn't kind of well-written that gives you a, a, a day in the life of each class. So it's kind of a class-cased type of a society going on within the cities, whereas the out, outer regions are described as more nomadic, more tribal type of a life. Um, and there's a lot of emphasis given in here. For example, uh, the, the, the way of the scholar is a, a way of life that, leads to an additional spells. Several different spells are, are available for clerics. Each of the gazetteers, not each of them, a lot of the gazetteers presents new spells as well that have been balanced for, for Mistara specific to a region. So, I mean, that gives you the impetus for someone to, to, for a wizard, a magic user, to want to travel to the different regions to learn spells that they may not be able to have access to in their other kingdom. It's a nice little, nice little additional touch, giving you a little bit more flavor. A social structure is is kind of a little bit more pertinent in Yalarum than it was in Grand Duchy. Uh, Karamekos, you were either a soldier, part of the the influx of colonists, or you were a, a native just trying to take care of yourself. That was still survival mode. Uh, uh, Yalarum is a little bit more developed. There, there, they've gone from tribal nomadic to very well and civilized. They're developing their own magic. They have a university that's uh, re re respected and recognized across Mistara. So, you know, a tale of two nations right next to each other. Uh, internal policies, they talk about a lot of the politics within. Uh, you, your party can be exposed to a lot of tribal intrigue, a lot of, of trans-border inter-regional politics, you know, as, as you can, when, you, when the country's ran by a large bureaucracy, then there's going to be a, a breakdown. Uh, here's a nice cool little thing that's given for you. Um, if you're a Eurocentric player, 
by that what I mean is most of your fantasy, um, most of what you've been exposed to in fantasy RPGs has been the the Franco Frankish knight, the the English baron, and all of that. This does give you a cultural translation. You know, a king would be in a mirror, an emperor would be a sultan, a count would be a beg or a bay. Adabeg is a governor, archduke versus Malik, sheik, tribal faris. Now, again, that's where this product can be accused of cultural appropriation. Oh, how dare they? But I would call that education. You know, that's a, a short, quick table that gives me an understanding of a different culture's recognition of a royal title. You know, so, it, you know, a cavalier versus a knight versus, you know, a charisse. Those kind of things. They add to, they can add to the, the immersion in a world if they're handled properly. Um, it takes a little bit of Google searching and, and, uh, and just to confirm what you're, what you're presenting is, is fact, near fact, or as near fact as what we call D&D to begin with. So uh, internal policies are going to give you a little, bit of, a little bit of information to work with within the nation in of itself. Uh, external policies will tell you how they view external nations, uh, how well is the Emirates of Ularum getting along with, Thyatis getting along with, um, the Rock Home, the, the Gnomes and Doors of Rock Home, uh, Kairamakos. Uh, there's one of these lands that we'll take a look at. I want to say, was it Darokan? Uh, there's one of the regions that's just magic. It's, it's a majocracy. It's almost like the predecessor to Thay, as it were. It's kind of interesting. Set in Beck Me terms. Uh, laws and customs gives you a brief institute on what's what's in, what's important, what's considered le legal murder versus self defense. How how do you handle judgments? How do you handle sentences? Law enforcement is it handled by the tribes? Is it handled by a local policeman? Is it handled by an appointed sheriff? So on and so forth. So this is good stuff to have when you're building a world, when you're filling out a world, especially if you're going to dip your toe into into Yularum or into Mistara. Again, it's. A big looking map, but I, I would caution you, you know, for grins, I'm going to go ahead and flop over. This is a uh, 598CY map of Greyhawk. This is the world of Greyhawk is the first edition. This is the AD&D peer to, to Mistara, okay? So as we zoom in on this hex scale, this is, the, this is a uh, identical scale on the hexes. But it's a little harder to see because of the art style of it. But honestly, I would estimate that Mistara would take up about this much of the area in, in relation to the size of Greyhawk. So it's a much smaller area. It's, it's kind of interesting. It might be immersion breaking for you and your campaign. It might not. But it's nice to have a lot of this crap within a, a month's ride of each other, two months' ride of each other, whereas sometimes in, in Greyhawk and certainly Forgotten Realms, you're hand-waving two weeks of journeys just to cover, you know, Baldur's Gate to, to, to Neverwinter. You, you know, that's a horrifying stretch of, of territory to, to play a whole lot of. You know what I mean? That, that in and itself is going to be its own year-long campaign. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So far, so 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 far, so good. I think this is a slightly better presentation of the information than the GAZ one, which happens. You know, I mean, it's a production cycle. You learn from each of your products, and some things get better, some things change a little bit. Uh, then there's a section that's kind of in the middle, the the yellow section. It's more for player player knowledge. It does the same thing as far as giving you a a style, a naming style. Could be considered culturally insensitive, despite the fact that it's been heavily researched at the time. That's up to you. But yes, you have a, a styling name for your residents, your tribal charting names, um, just to give if you want the campaign to have that flavor. You know, uh, physical appearances. You know, a lot of cool rules to add into your campaign for consideration for travel rates in the desert. Heat exhaustion, impact of, of the desert sands, the desert impact on you. Um, there's a concept of honor that was was presented here as part of a, a part and parcel of a leveling aspect. It was also part of Oriental Adventures at the same time. Um, they had to put in a mechanic to make people behave properly. <laughs> well, let's be honest. Honor doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot in Western societies. It means a lot in Eastern societies. 
Um, respect doesn't mean a whole lot to, to upper class. It means a lot to lower class. And so it's a cultural reflection, and it's not because it's not there doesn't mean it's bad. It's just different. Uh, you have a glossary that breaks down a lot of the terms that you'll find listed in the in the pub publication as you go through it. Um, and then you get into a couple more of these smaller items. Rather than detailing out every location as they did in Karamekos, giving you a who's in charge, what's the population, all of that, this one kind of takes an example. This is an example of the village of Kirkuk. Uh, gets into a lot of detail on the actual city and this is kind of one of those, everything is similar to Kirkuk. You can adjust the rest of it to fit your particular style. Uh, campaigning in your Lorem. Let's find Kirkuk on the map just for fun. Just for fun. The village of Kirkuk. Where is it at? It may not even be a real village because it's just an example. Oh, here we are. So your village of Kirkuk is actually going to be different from Hedzaji or Kunzets because it doesn't have a, it's not sitting in the middle of a desert by an oasis field. So that's the first and foremost thing to keep in mind. But I was just curious. So that's, that's kind of a, a, an example of a borderland type of a village, how things are going, what you're looking at over there. So continuing along with the product, it's very similar to GAZ1, covering a completely different style of geography, a different kind of, of climate, and a different kind of culture goes into more detail in your economics as well. Campaigning, um, this gives you some information. For example, the first thing is how much should your characters know? Are they, re that's you help in helping you decide, are they residents of Yalarum? Do they need to get into the, assume native stance, get the names, get the, get the, all of that? Or are they coming from outside? If they're exploring from outside coming in, for example, uh, there's two modules, X4, the Desert Nomads, X5, Temple of Death, those two rank in the top 20 of modules from all editions, I believe. If you look at some of the rankings, they're great, great modules. And it's almost worth taking a visit to Yalarum just to play through that, that mini-series. Uh, that's me going off on a tangent. But um, yeah, if you're, if you're familiar with X4, X5, this is where it's set. If you're not familiar with that, get familiar with those great modules. But anyway... Um, so this gives you some some timelines as a dungeon master, as a, as a referee, to use the information at different points in the timeline. Not just taking 1000 AC as your start date. What if you want to play a bit earlier? What if you want to play a little bit later? It, it gives you some information to help you um, address that, which is, which is a, a good thing to have. It doesn't necessarily require you to play the same timeline even within the campaign. It gives you the information. Um, introducing the players gives them some hooks, gives you some hooks to bring them in, gives you some some guidelines to, that will make sense for them to transfer over, whether it's part of a mission or, or anything like that. Campaign structures there. That's actually just a little bit more of a DM's guide for slight adjustments you might have to take in regard to leveling because of the, the emphasis on honor and role play as part of the campaign environment rather than everything being killing and gold looting, which was just standards. Um, Deciding on an ultimate evil, figuring out who's going to be the BBEG gives you some 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 links and some ideas that are setting in history, uh, based in the setting and based in the history that you know can can continue along with the immersion. Monsters, men, and marvelous beings. A big breakdown of the different monsters that are available. This gets a little bit more into detail, kind of of the the block list that was at the start of GAZ one. This gets a a, a lot. Gives you a lot more detail. Where would you find carrion crawlers? The wilderness, typical monster encounter. Lions would be located on coastal plains, Nithian and Dithestentian highlands. Uh, the Yalari regard the lion as a noble beast of great. So it's cool. In, in addition to giving you where would the monster be found, it gives you um, cultural aspects for those animals that are, might be worse, treated differently in this region, whereas they are in others. Uh, good to, good table, really good table to have that will help you kind of key in and, and make sense with your encounter and monster placement. Uh, staging traps and curses and fabled treasures of the magical lamps. Yes, there's a whole subsection on finding the lamps with the digins in them. Uh, the beads of oblivion, you put some, some custom magic items are available in here. Fifth edition, uh, there's balancing you're going to have to play with because, for example, the Beat of Oblivion is considered a master level item, 25 plus. And I was wrong 
Um, Beck me goes to level 36. Your your top end level was 36 at Immortal, so I was I was wrong saying it went to 25. My apologies. Uh, but yeah, so you're dealing with some very high level potential uh, magic items and and legendary things that you're gonna have to come up with. Gives you seeds, gives you ideas for for your traditional Beck me. There's there's rule systems allow for it for fifth edition translations. Use it your own, you know own risk be buyer beware when you're making mythical items it's really really easy to overpower them <laughs> so then we get into after that you get into the actual adventures what are some some adventure hooks just like gaz1 this gives you some some starts some seed ideas for adventures some starts for adventures some things that you can use to tie one one geographic place in with another and give the party something to do along the way um, you'll see as you look at it a little alphanumeric, actually it's just alphabetic designation. You'll see B's, X's, CM's, any, you might, as we scroll down, you might see an B, X, C, M, M, even an I. That's that's referring to basic for B, X is for expert, that's your level guide. Basic is one to three, expert is four to six, or four to nine actually, my apologies. Companion is 10 to 15, masters is eight or 10 to 18. Masters 19 to 25-ish, and then Masters from there up. So, so yeah. Uh, we'll take a look at the art real quick. I was trying to keep these a little bit shorter than, you know, than they have been. I might end up going into a little bit more long form because I feel like I'm giving you just a glimpse of these products and without really giving you enough to go, oh, my God, it's so cool. You should get it. Because, oh, my God, it's so cool. You should get it. But, you know, just kind of reiterating what I was talking about previously if you're looking for a new world to play with, if you're looking for a new setting to immerse your party in, uh, and you don't mind doing a little bit of legwork, take a look at Mistara. It's a it's a pretty good sized region. There's a lot of content out there ready for for adoption, ready for you to pick up at a you know low price. It's a low price point of entry. Lots of stuff ready to go, and it's not a huge region. Downside is it is dated content. The writing could be problematic. Some of the presentations of the cultures might be considered uh, insensitive or inappropriate. I'm not going to argue that. I'm going to argue that the content might still be useful for you and your party. Um, so take a look at it. You know, the, the area up here, all kinds of red skulls of death. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the Gazetteer series, GAZ1 through GAZ14 or 15, uh, encompasses the known world of Mistara and goes into a lot of detail to give the dungeon masters or referees. At this point, you could take this and put it into Pathfinder Hell. And no one really cares. It's fun. Uh, the content should be considered system agnostic. There's really very few stat blocks that are even given as part of the Gazetteer series. Um, so, so you shouldn't feel like you're tied into... Oh, I have to play basic because of no. There's there's not a lot of stat blocks that are given. So you have the flexibility to use it for whichever system you want. You have a nice map region out there. You have well-defined economics. You have well-defined politics. You have well-defined cultures for each of these regions. Um, if you're a world builder, pick one of them up. doesn't matter which one. Well, no, it doesn't matter which one. Because they're, they're, they're good products to help guide you in building your world. What are the things that you need to look for as you build a world? What are the things that you want to consider? To, to make your world more engaging, to keep your world in, to give your world that living sense, give it some history, give it some conflict that's there that doesn't even affect, that, that doesn't have an effect on the players' lives, but has an effect on the bearing of the world. What are the trade things? Is Does everyone have access to all the food in the world? Are you able to grow oranges up in the, 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 the tundra north? You know, things like that. And it's like, we obviously go, well, no, a lot of that stuff's obvious, but until you really sit down and start drawing it out and writing it up it's not that obvious man you know it's in your brain so i mean and if you're building a world just for you and your play group and it's all stored in your head then you know none of this matters but if you're wanting to share your world then certainly you know take a look at some of these guides take a look at some of these to help you with writing styles with formatting with presentation and with what not to do with some of the stuff you look at and go oh they should have written that like that well you know now you know not to write it like that as well but um, I'm going to go ahead and close up my recording now. This has been a DM Geezer Presents Classic D&D Content. We're looking at the Gazetteer series for Mistara. 
I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm over on Twitch as well. Uh, if you're over there, follow me over there. I'd love to hear hear from you, chit chat, and you know, do that kind of thing. And in the meantime, uh, you feel free to. We'd love to have your support over on Facebook. We'd love to have your support over on Patreon. I have some products available on Etsy. Everything can be found with DM Geezer Jim. Uh, you found me on my YouTube. You can find me everywhere else. You can follow my bottom of my page for some links. But thank you for your time. Thank you for your views. Like, share, and follow if you have enjoyed it. And look for more.